Amen. Well, good morning. Yes, our God is the Lord of the dance. We should be dancing more often in church. I love that song. It is a joy to be in worship with each and every one of you this morning here at Spring Hill Avenue United Methodist Church, worshiping at Westside. Uh, I must say, I'm dissatisfied. I thought we were edging toward fall. And, uh, or is this fall? Is this Mobile fall? This is disappointing. Now we carry on. I want to invite you during this time to stand as you are able or in spirit and let us join together in the greeting and opening prayer which can be found in your bulletins. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. Our souls long in detail thank for the courts of the Lord. Our hearts and flesh sing for joy to the living God. Happy are those who live in your house, ever singing your praise. Happy are those whose strength is in you. Let us continue together in prayer. O, o Lord, Lord, giver of life and source of freedom, we know that all we have received is from your hand. You call us to be stewards of your abundance, the caretakers of all you have entrusted to us. Help us to always use your gifts wisely and teach us to share them generously. May our faithful stewardship bear witness to the love of Christ in our lives. We pray with grateful hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. In this time, I want to invite you to turn in your hymnals to number 154 as we sing together, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
be seated. That was marvelous, choir. Also, I mean, do y'all see what's going on back here? This is pretty spectacular. It's, I feel like it's not going to be long before I'm going to have to be, like, preaching this direction. We're just going to get all of y'all up in there. Our choir uh, yesterday had their choir retreat preparing for the season of Advent, which wildly enough is just over a month away. Uh, and they spent the entire day practicing very hard at the Allen's house and uh, got to stop in for a moment. And y'all, Advent's going to be spectacular. I'm pumped and for it. And Kristen brought us lunch. That's, I mean, that's all, that's all I could contribute. I'm definitely not going to be singing with them. <laughs> y'all don't want that. But a couple of uh, announcements want to let you know about uh, during this time. Uh, the first is that if you are interested in being a part of the choir, by all means, feel free to join them. They practice every Wednesday evenings at 6.30 p.m. and then Sunday mornings at 9.45 a.m. Uh, but we have a couple of other ways that you can get involved as well. Uh, this evening we have our Sunday evening Bible study that is continuing to look at the book of Enoch. And if you have not ever read the book of Enoch... This is probably for the best. <laughs> it is a very weird book. A very weird book, but we're having a great time picking it apart and uh, understanding how uh, these, what we call non-canonical texts, these apocryphal books, uh, play into our own faith. All are invited to join us at 6 o'clock p.m. on Sunday evenings for that. And then Tuesday mornings, we have our Tuesday morning Bible study at 10.30 a.m., continuing through the book of 2 Kings. Uh, now, while we're continuing through the month of October, which wildly enough we have one week left of, uh, we are in this time of stewardship, a time in which we are really focusing on what it means to prepare ourselves for next year and how we're going to contribute uh, to the mission of Christ in our, in, through the ministries of our church in the year 2023. And so uh, you'll notice each week we have these uh, pledge cards which is just something you can fill out to let us know how you're committed in 2023 to the ministry of the church and the mission of Christ through the ministries of the church. And you can uh, fill this out. We encourage you to hold on to this, however, and wait until next Sunday. Next Sunday, October 30th, is going to be our Commitment Sunday. And on that day, we'll be taking our pledge cards and bringing them up to the altar uh, as a sign of our offering a commitment to God in 2023. So hang on to those. Also, I do need to let you know, as we're getting ever closer to October 30th, we are looking to have uh, these forms filled out and returned if you are interested. These forms are basically permission forms that if you would like for your information to be uh, disclosed in our church directory and our Breeze app, which will be coming out soon, uh, then this is how you let us know. If you don't fill out one of these forms, we won't include any of your information in either of these mediums. But you can also let us know what kind of information you want us to include. Like if you just want your name in there, perfect, we'll just put your name in there. If you want us to get all the way down to your social security numbers and credit card information, we'll happily include that as well. Uh, but this is just a permission form you can fill out and let us know by next Sunday if you would like for your information to be in that. Uh, those forms can be found at either entrance to the church. During this month, we, are, we have our mission project as uh, collecting blankets for inner city and waterfront rescue mission. Uh, new and gently used blankets can be brought up to the church office anytime during the week, and we'll be taking those and distributing them between those two organizations at the end of the month. But that's not all we're doing this month. We're also collecting supplies for uh, cleaning buckets that will be uh, sending on down to Florida at the end of this month to help with uh, all of the mitigation after Hurricane Ian uh, struck there. So you can find a list of everything we need left for those buckets in your bulletin. Some of those items are marked out. That means we have those and we're good there. Uh, but the other supplies we could definitely use as we continue to uh, fill these buckets and get them ready to be sent down. Next Wow, this Saturday, I mean, time is moving fast. This Saturday is our trunk or treat. We're going to be in the Spring Hill Avenue UMC parking lot uh, from 4.30 p.m. Uh, to 6 o'clock p.m. doing our trunk or treat out there. If you would like to decorate a trunk, we would love for you to do so. You can even arrive much earlier than 4.30 if you would like to start decorating on site. Uh, and also come in your best costumes because we will have both a costume contest and a best dressed trunk contest uh, with gift card prizes so you definitely want to be in on this uh, decorated out as much as you would like and we're just gonna have a great time out there in the parking
parking lot, inviting our community to participate in this age-old church tradition. Uh, then, the very following Saturday, is the first ever Midtown Marketplace. We are going to be hosting on our grounds this farmer's market-like event. We already have 33 vendors who are going to be there. I mean, that's a pretty big marketplace. It's going to be spectacular. Uh, and so we're going, you know, we'll, we'll also be selling the gumbo and pulled pork. You can pre-order your gumbo right now, uh, just letting us know what you would like so we can have that ready for you. Um, but, you know, we'll be going from 8 a.m. until 4 o'clock p.m. But we need some volunteers to help us out because, I mean, this has all of a sudden become an enormous undertaking. And so we have sign-up sheets that are in two-hour increments. If you would like to help out that day, we'll be starting with, uh, with checking uh, vendors in as early as 6 o'clock a.m. And uh, we'll have things going throughout the entire day. And the last shift is from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. is our cleanup shift. And we have different things like serving food, running the cash register, uh, helping with parking, trash pickup, stuff like that. So if you're interested in helping out for this event, even just, I mean, just for one two-hour slot, that would be spectacular. Uh, please see either Lynn Merchant or Kay Lauber, both who are in the nursery right now, uh, after church, and they'll show you where the sign-up sheet is. We would love your assistance with that. Uh, then, I do want to let you know that, that that's it. <laughs> I think that's it. I don't see any hands. <laughs> We're going to call that it for now. Nope, I remembered what it was. Immediately after worship, we do have our guidance board meeting together. Uh, and I do want to let you know about this because all are always invited to these meetings. You can always come and just sit in, hear what's going on in the life of the church, lift up your voices to concerns or questions you might have. Uh, those are not closed meetings unless there's a very specific kind of topic we have to discuss. Uh, like last week, they had to talk about pastor compensation stuff. Those are the kind of closed meetings. But everything else is open to the public. I uh, would love for you to hear what's going on in the life of that. But we'll be meeting right after worship at 11 o'clock. So with that being said, I want to invite you during this time to stand as you are able or in spirit. And let us join together as we affirm our faith in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. be seated. And in this time, let us turn our hearts to the Lord as we receive the scripture lesson. The Old Testament lesson comes from Deuteronomy 8, 17 through 18. Do not say to yourself, my power and the might of my own hand have gotten me this wealth. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth so that he may confirm his covenant that he swore to you, your ancestors, as he is doing today. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. In true Methodist fashion, I invite you to stand once more as you are able or in spirit and turn in your hymnals to number 451 as we lift our voices together to sing, Be Thou My Vision. Thank you. 
Amen. You may be seated. Well, during this time, as we prepare to present our tithes and offerings, we do want to make mention that this is the time we are focusing on stewardship, what it means to be uh, caretakers of what God has given us, what it means to invest in the mission and ministry of God. And so during this time, we've been focusing on a series called My Something is Yours, recognizing how what we have is God's. And you've also been hearing from some of our uh, guidance board members on what it means to uh, be part of the ministry of the church by our giving, by our stewardship. And so for this week, I'm going to invite up Ms. Frances Sibley, who's going to bring a word about stewardship for us this morning. Hey, y'all, this is not the old lady that's going to tell you the story about how I helped somebody with their grocery bill one day for $20, and a week later, somebody paid my grocery bill, which was $40. And I said, I don't need to be repaid. Yes, you do. I watched you come in the grocery store, and you know everybody in here. I'm not going to tell you that story about how God doubles what you give. I'm going to tell you what we as Christians should be doing since we are the caretakers of this beautiful place that he has given us. And we in the South especially, man, we have the beach, we have the water, all kinds of water, we have the beautiful trees, we have all of the beautiful flowers. He created all of that for us to enjoy. But the only way you can enjoy something is if you take care of it. And how are we supposed to take care of it? Well, through giving, stewardship of money, and then that's not all. You gotta give your time. You know, if you don't give up a little time and do little special things in the name of the Lord, that's not being a good steward of that. And prayer. You need to spend time in prayer. I don't know about y'all, but sometimes when I get up in the morning, I've got to vacuum that room. I hate it. And I'm, I'm vacuuming that room. I'm saying a good prayer. That helps me get through vacuuming by talking to Jesus as I pray. And you can do the same. A neighbor over on Spring Hill Avenue that was my good friend who has recently passed away, Love to watch Micah. She said, you know, God brought him to you, didn't he? I said, yes. I've been in the church 50 years, and I can't name any minister. All of them had special talents. But Micah has so many that don't you think that it's not just a fluke that God put he and his wife where they are? His wife's mother's best friend and college roommate is married to the lead minister at Ashland Place. God said, oh, you know what? She'll be happy there. God had sense enough to know that if the missus is happy, everybody else is happy. <laughs> so then he said, you know, we got a lot coming down the pike with Spring Hill Avenue. And when Micah first came, before we knew it, Micah and I were counting 22 kids coming up to the altar for the morning with the children. He was visiting a lot of people. Our church was on the move. And when the pandemic hit, do you think that stopped Micah? No. He just figured out how to do all this electronic stuff. And we saw him on the internet on Sunday. And one day during the week, he spoke from his home uh, he would go over there and visit with those carpenters and all that. Mary Lou, my neighbor, said, every time I go to the store, Micah is over there at your church talking next to a truck driver or somebody 
or he's blowing up stuff for kids to come and play with on Saturday, or he's putting tables and chairs out for them to do things with. I said, yeah, God has a plan. We just have to be willing to say, okay, God. And, you know, we're one of the things that we need to be grateful for and to love is that God chose Micah and his wife to be a part of Mobile and a part of our life because it has benefited us so. Yeah, we don't have 50 people on Sunday right now, but when we get home, we're going to have 200 people in that church. Micah's already planned for it. But you've got to believe, and you've got to give your money so that we can turn the power on. You've got to give your time because this is what we need is people to give time. And you've got to give your prayers. Now, Michael, before I leave, I need you to come up here with me. Oh, you know what? I've got to get something. Come stand right here. Full disclosure, I don't know what's about to happen. <laughs> Is this where y'all kick me out of the church? <laughs> Never. Never. No. <laughs> This is one of the things that my friend Mary Lou said to me one day about Micah. You know, he's kind of like your Superman. Everywhere I go, I see Micah out in the churchyard. And y'all don't even live there right now. I said, no, but he is. He's our Superman. So, Micah, this is not only Stewardship Month, but it's Pastor Appreciation Month. So, it's not a bird. It's not a plane, but it's Superman. <laughs> You've got a Superman face. You can wear during the holidays. This is spectacular. Wait, why during the holidays? I'm about to wear this right now. He is our Superman, and I'm... we should show gratefulness to God because he brought Micah and Christian to us. There he is. That's our, that's our Superman minister. Is this sacrilegious? Okay. <laughs> all right. Michael, we love you. You are part of what all is going on with God. And we just have to have enough faith. And everybody says, oh, oh my gosh, it's been two and a half years. Has he not punished us enough? Well, we're not being punished. We're just being taught to sit and wait on God. And it's coming. Mike and I have a whole program that we thought we were going to do back last summer. We thought we were going to do it this past October. We really thought we were going to do it during Christmas this year. Now it's going to be April or June. But you know what? We're going to get there because we trust God. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Francis. And thank you all. Um, I really do appreciate all of this. I have to say, though, you know, I don't know. I, I came here to just serve. Uh, and, you know, a, a pastor is only so much. As uh, you might know, a past, the word pastor comes from uh, really the word shepherd. Um, and a shepherd is nothing but a fool with a stick without some sheep. Uh, a pastor is nothing but a fool with a robe uh, without a church, and uh, it's, it's each and every one of you who make the difference in this community, that make a, the difference for what it means for us to be Spring Hill Avenue United Methodist Church. Um, I can't do it. I, I, I literally cannot be the church myself. We do this together, and I'm just so grateful to be a part of all of this. And it is your generosity, your stewardship that makes it all possible. So... With that being said, I want to offer you this reminder from 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, which says, Each of you must give as you have made up your mind, not reluctantly nor under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. I want to remind you that we have many different ways that your giving can be done online, by mail, by text, by our credit card kiosk in the lobby, and also by the classic offering plates. So with that being said, let us go to the Lord together in prayer. Let us pray.
Good and gracious God, we give you thanks for the many blessings which you have poured out upon us, both seen and unseen. Now, as we return a portion of those blessings back to you, we ask that you would bless both the gift and the giver, that each might be used to glorify and magnify your name among the earth, and that by our generosity we might see the world transformed. We ask this in your perfect and holy name. Amen. And you may be seated. And during this time, I want to invite up all of the children for this morning's children's moment. Good morning. How are y'all doing today? Good. Uh, me too. Yeah, good. Got something here. 
What's this? A penny. Yeah. Whose face is on the penny? Abraham Lincoln. Nice job. Here you go. Thomas Edison would be a great person to be on there. Even better would be Nikolai Tesla. Very underrated inventor. Uh, wait. I now have this. What is this? A nickel. Anybody know whose face is on the nickel? You're very close with the first name. Thomas Jefferson. You want another one? <laughs> now what do I have here? A dime. Anybody know whose face is on the dime? I always forget this one. It's still not going to be Thomas Edison. I'm sorry. <laughs> you are very close. It was actually, it is a Roosevelt. So I'm going to give this to you. But it's actually Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Nice job. Yeah, I always forget that it's Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Good figure. And then what do I have here? A quarter. A quarter. And whose face is on this? It is George Washington. Nice job. <laughs> Believe you me, I have more coins. So we have a quarter, and we decided that George Washington's face is on this quarter. Why is his face on the quarter? Yes, he was the first president, but did you know his face wasn't on the quarter originally? In fact, it was a uh, standing liberty up until 1923, you know, history facts. Um, we put people's faces on our currency as a sign of respect, as a sign of recognition that somebody has done something significant for our people, for our country. And George Washington being the first president and the one who led the United States to independence, I feel like he, you know, qualifies for this. Abraham Lincoln, you know, Emancipation Proclamation, 16th President, all that good stuff, like he's done some pretty good stuff for human rights. Yeah, sure, let's include him in all of that. Thomas Jefferson is up there. Uh, I feel like we could have replaced him with Alexander Hamilton, uh, but you know, that <laughs> just depends on how you feel about the musical. <laughs> and Thomas Edison probably should be up there. You're right. I'm, I'm going to give that to you. But we do this as a sign of respect for people who have done great things. And in Jesus' day, they also had a, the picture of someone on their coins. It was the emperor at the time, Caesar Augustus. And his face was on these coins. And at one point, Jesus was asked by people in leadership, should we give this money and pay it as a tax, give it back to the government? And Jesus says, whose face is on the coin? And they say, Caesar's. And Jesus says, give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and give back to God's what is God's. Now this is a pretty confusing thing to say because is Jesus saying that, that the coin belongs to Caesar? For instance, our coin has George Washington's face on it. Does this belong to George Washington? Why not? Because, well, yeah, I mean, because he's dead, yeah. It's, a, it's pretty difficult to own stuff whenever you passed away, for sure. Um, yes, and we could go into all of the other uh, crazy details about all of this, but we come back to, where did this come from? In the very beginning, where did it come from? From the earth, and where did the earth come from? God. So, would this really be George Washington's quarter, or would this be God's quarter? Perhaps. Jesus never actually answers the question. He just tells people to use it for good. So, who doesn't have coins? Boom, 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 boom. Hi. Oh, got two? Sneaky. Use it for good. Will you pray with me? Let's pray. Repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for your love and the things you provide for us. May we use these things to give you glory. Amen. All right, y'all. We're going to be following Miss Bobby to Kids Shine. Y'all have a great time in there. Uh, y'all, that volunteer list is starting to get a... Uh, pretty thin. So if you're interested in helping out with Kids Shine, just let us know. We would love to have you in there with our kids. It's such a worthwhile endeavor. During this time, let us turn our hearts to the New Testament lesson. 
Then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap him in what he said. So they sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with truth and show deference to no one. But you do not regard people with partiality, for you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. Then he said to him, them, Whose head is this and whose title? They answered, Caesar's. Then he said to them, Give therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, and they left him and went away. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you so much, Will. I'm sorry for stealing your thunder during the children's moment. I, I'm going to have to, I'm like starting to sweat. This thing is thick. This off for a moment. Uh, let us go to the Lord together in prayer. God of grace, goodness, all provision, we come before you during this time seeking to know you more. May our hearts be opened, our minds be ready to encounter you in ways we never have before. We ask that you would reveal yourself to us through the scriptures that we call holy through the teachings you are working through your Holy Spirit in our heart and through our communion and conversation together. I ask that during this time, the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts on your words be good and pleasing and acceptable to you, O God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. I want to start with kind of a light uh, question this morning. What do you think of taxes If I just mention the word taxes, does it bring up some, like, discomfort, frustration, anxiety? Maybe you're like, yeah, more of that necessary. Yeah, I hear that. I hear that. Uh, well, really, I, I guess I should start with a, a slightly different question. And I, I implore you no condemning statements of other uh, people who think, might think differently than you. But just simply to ask, to answer the question how do you feel like taxes should be used? To help people in need. To help people in need. I like that. Yeah. Other thoughts? The things they were intended to do. Mm. Equitably. Equitably. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think these are, these are fair and reasonable things to, to ask of our taxes. I mean, uh, if, you, if we really get down to it, the entire intent of taxes is for public service. For instance, how did you get here this morning? The, the roads? Yeah. I, I don't know about you, but I personally did not pave those roads. Uh, they were paved by a group that was paid for through taxes. Um, it would be great if we had better public transportation there, but I guess that would also require taxes, huh? Uh, yeah, they are meant for public service. Things like education, infrastructure, financial support, global connections, social programming, uh, these broad sweeping categories that are meant to essentially bring about a healthy community, human flourishing of sorts. And yes, of course, there is no denying there's always, always going to be some amount of corruption in the way that those funds are allocated because we ask humans to do the job. Yeah, go figure. But that's not the intention of taxes. In fact, at their uh, very base, if we really see how taxes can be used, they're a payment to cultivate human flourishing if used properly. They are our return payment on the resources of which we take advantage. Uh, in fact, Henry David Thoreau, fascinating guy, by the way, definitely should read uh, any of his, of his works or biography. Uh, but in his work, Civil Disobedience, 
Uh, you might think you know where this is going. But in his work, Civil Disobedience, Henry David Thoreau comments on actually our passage from Matthew 22 this morning, the instructions to give back to Caesar. Uh, he uses the words, If you use money which has the image of Caesar on it, and which he has made current and valuable, that is, if you are men of the state, and gladly enjoy the advantages of Caesar's government, then pay him back some of his own when he demands it. In other words, this whole question of paying taxes, he's essentially saying, if you benefit from it, pay it forward. It's kind of an investment. Now, let me be very clear here. I'm not anybody who's going to tell you how you should be spending your money. I will encourage you, don't try to evade your taxes. Uh, most people don't benefit uh, well from that. I say most people because I guess there are exceptions, but I can't, I'm not going to recommend anything financial this morning. But really just to think, to question, to consider. Because... We enjoy certain privileges provided by the government. We got here on roads. Though some of them might not be paved to our liking. We benefit from the street lights. Uh, I'm a product of public education. I, I know things are like different down in Mobile. Like I, I still don't understand the whole private, private school system versus public school system. Freaks me out. I only knew public school uh, and really enjoyed it, but I gained that benefit. It was great. Uh, we have these benefits that we reap from there. So, if we are to take Henry David Thoreau's words to heart, shouldn't we continue to support that? Now, here's where it gets interesting, and really where I want us to go today, is by asking the question, do we not also enjoy certain privileges and advantages from God. Today, we get into the question of, what does God want with my money? What does God want with my money? And we start with a different question. Why do we call it my money? Now, this is, <laughs> this is where I really, whenever I was preparing the sermon, I wanted to just get out there and like, I wanted to ask everybody to wear sandals this morning so I could just come by and just start stomping on some toes. I'm going to try to be a little bit more polite, though. Why do we call it my money? The easy answer is, I earned it. I worked for it. That's why it's mine. But I, I mean, that's all well and good, sure. Uh, but then we also need to kind of wrestle with the question, how do we know when something belongs to someone? when someone has a certain ownership over that, whenever it is theirs versus mine. And uh, we have different standards for this. Uh, by and large, we would say that if I were to come over here and I were to build, I don't know, a box, we'll just say that. If I were to stand here and build a box, whose box would that be? Mine, because I made it, right? Yeah, 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 that's, uh, that's one of our standards that something belongs to someone if they are the ones who crafted it. By that standard, however, every single penny of our finances belongs to the U.S. Treasury. Ooh, yikes. And by that standard, everything belongs to God. Then we get to the other standard we hold. Is it based on who had it first? Right, so, you know, if I, if I have something, boom, I'll pull out my phone here. I have something, and let's say it's, I just leave it around, and somebody finds it, and, you know, we had the whole finders keepers things growing up, but we know that's not actually true, right? Uh, somebody might find this. It's still mine, right? Because I had it first. But if that standard is true, then the very land which we are on today actually belongs to the Choctaw, Chickasaw, and Ch Chateau people. Not us. And, by extension, if it's based on who had it first, everything belongs to God. And then we get to the whole, is it really based on who earned it? That we consider ownership 
And this is a difficult subject. This is a difficult standard to even measure because I know, uh, I know the people working in the Colombian coffee fields from whence much of our coffee beans originate, they work far harder than do the people who drink that roast at Starbucks but still make 100 times the amount that they do. Is it really about who earned it? Because they work a lot harder than most people I know. Oh, and so we get into this really sticky conversation whenever we start talking about who earned it, but we might actually recall the one who works tirelessly for all of existence and remember for one more moment that everything belongs to God. Now, of course, we could continue this conversation all day trying to parse out what it means for something to belong to someone, but we come back to the original question of why do we call it my money? Why is it my? Perhaps this comes from our need to control certain things. Maybe it comes from our need to be right. If it's my money, I can choose what's the right way to use it. Or perhaps we really are just that selfish about it. Whatever the reason might be, the words of Christ call us to consider how pointless that very notion might be. The very concept of my money. Because it's not about who owns it. It's about how it's used, which, by the way, is a horrible misquote of Scripture, uh, the actual verse. Anybody know what it actually says about money? The love, of money? the love of money. Yeah, that's right. The love of money is the root of all evil. Uh, that's because money itself is not inherently good or bad. It's this general neutral of a tool. And tools can be used for great harm or great good. I have a cute little hammer here. I wanted to bring in a really big one, but I forgot. What could I use this for right now? To break things. Fascinating. That's the first thing. You see a hammer and you think break things. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> I was looking at all these nice little windows. It just tink. Put another crack in this. I don't know. What else could I use this for? Yeah, to hammer in a nail. Maybe I can use, the fi use this to fix something. That rail leading up the stairs is kind of loose. Man, go back in there. I think those are screws, not nails. But anyway, I could, I could hammer a screw. That would work just fine. Yeah, a, a tool is a generally neutral object. I get to choose what kind of impact it makes. Huh, no pun intended. I get to choose if this is going to be a source of destruction or a source of construction to build up or to tear down. Even though it might be mine, and this actually isn't mine, this belongs to Kay. I stole it from your desk. She had it first, right, so it must be hers. Uh, even though this might be mine, how I use it is going to be, make much more of a difference than whether or not it is mine. But the very concept of placing the status of mine onto this hammer immediately says that, you know what, I'm not going to let this extend beyond what I need or what I want. And this is where it becomes a little bit more dangerous. Because I know, without a doubt, there are probably several of these midtown homes that could use a good hammer. Right? I mean, you know, you get a home old enough, they probably just need a couple of those boards put back into place. But I'm not going to go into these people's homes and fix things for them, unless they're going to pay me generously. Maybe. Uh, but I'm going to use this for what I need it for. If I have something that needs to be hammered, I actually prefer a drill. Oh, that's much easier. But I have another tool here with us. Yeah, you thought I was going to bring out a saw, didn't you? I thought about it. Uh, this rope here. This rope is mine. And I can use it for great good or not. But we're going to play a little game. Anybody ever played the game The Floor is Lava? Yeah. <laughs> the Floor is Lava is a very simple concept. The floor is lava. Don't touch the lava or you're going to get burned. Um, so you're all out there sitting in these pews and the pews are slowly sinking into the lava. And I feel like I could help you out. I've got rope. 
It might not be very strong, but I feel like it could, I feel like I could pull you out of the lava with this. But it's mine. I'm not sure that I want to help you out. Now, let me ask a question. Is this amount of rope worth more than a human life? It's not, but it's mine. Don't I get to make that decision? Value calls, yeah, this is gonna be tough. Now, I think that I could help somebody out here. The floor is lava. Here you go. Sure. All right, I'm gonna save Mark, because it's my rope. I like him more than the rest of you. Uh, so, uh, yes, as I rightfully do. Uh, so I'm gonna save him, but I feel like I can do more with this. This is actually a lot of rope. Mark, would you like to pass this on to somebody else too? You, you, you keep hold of that rope, you might need it. Yeah, you keep hold of that rope, but pass it on to somebody else. All right, perfect, BJ, we're gonna save you now too. You're gonna get out of the lava. I got two people on this rope, but I'm starting to run out of rope. I don't know that I want this rope to help somebody else out. Oh, look at them, they're just passing my rope around. You didn't have my permission to throw my rope over there. Fine, fine, you can have my rope. Well, then you're all just gonna drown in the lava. You don't wanna cut the rope. Yeah, you could, yeah, you have that choice, sure. Uh, Meg, would you like to pass that rope to somebody else? Happy birthday, by the way. Yeah, hang, hang on to that rope, though. You're going to need it. All right, Beverly, would you like to keep passing that rope around? Let's just go ahead and pass this rope around. Let's see how far it can go. I don't know. How, we might have enough here. I'm, I'm willing to risk all my rope to save you all from the floor is lava. We're just going to, yeah, just keep passing it around as long as it takes here. So I have this that's mine, and I know that it could do some good. But the thing is, is it's mine. And I might need this rope if the lava gets to me, right? I might need this rope if I get in danger, right? But I think I have enough to help us out. But I'm not sure that I have enough to help us out. But is it at least worth trying? You don't want to leave somebody like uh, in the Titanic, what's her face, pushes Jack off the door. <laughs> Terribly cruel. <laughs> what was her name? Kate. Rose, thank you. <laughs> yeah, Rose just, sorry, bummer. What's that? That's true. Into the lava? Oh, okay. Yeah, so, so yes, absolutely. So we're starting to see that there's a little bit of an interesting connection going on here. Has anybody ever been, uh, been like rock climbing, actual rock climbing, not like in a rock gym, but like actual rock climbing? With other people too. Yeah, yes, yes. Uh, so there's, there's this interesting concept whenever you're rock climbing with other people, especially when you start getting higher up, that you, are suddenly very responsible for the other people who are up there with you based on the fact that you are connected by this rope. And you have the capacity to let somebody hang on for dear life if their hands can't do it for them. Uh, we're kind of doing this little exercise here ourselves. We have this tool, generally neutral tool. I can use it to be really mean and just like unwind it all right here and let it burn in the lava with the rest of you all. But also, this could be something that could actually make a big difference. Something that could spare somebody's life. Maybe literally, like in the case of the floor is lava. Maybe uh, in some kind of metaphorical way. Maybe just alleviate the pressure. This is what the church has been called to do with money. Anybody want to quote any scripture related to money? Aside from the whole money is the love of money is the root of all evil thing. We've already done that one. God loves, a giver. God loves a cheerful giver. How about that? I feel like we've heard that one today. Anybody else want to quote some scripture about money? Everybody's like, I really don't want to quote that one. The whole 
sell all your possessions and give the proceeds to the poor. Oh. Oh, if, you look across, uh, if you look across scripture, the points where people get it right about money, there are some points where people are pretty greedy about money, but the points where people get it right about money are the points where it's used as a tool to benefit others, to hold others up, to support one another. We get into the first church in Acts, and we see they were holding all things in common so that no one had a need among them. Imagine the good we could do by just stretching this a little bit further. So we all have a little, we're, we're getting there, we almost all have a little bit of rope here. I really just want to like get y'all to stand up and like start spinning around or something, see how tangled we can get. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to leave this here as my extension. Oh, there it is in the lava. Yikes. <laughs> Just like any tool, money can be used for great good or great evil or great neutral, and I could just stand here and watch you all burn, which I guess that's actually evil. But uh, this is something that can make a difference for us. And so I want to consider now the words that Jesus uh, tells the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Herodians, whenever he says, Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Give to God what is God's. You see, he never actually answers the question about taxes. And in fact, for two millennia, people have been picking apart this verse trying to figure out what does Jesus actually have to say about taxes and money. And they get to wildly different conclusions. That's because Jesus wasn't trying to answer the question that they proposed. Jesus was trying to get us to think about it a little bit more critically. Because just as taxes are intended to be used for good, so too is the are the funds that God calls us to utilize as well. So we recognize that you know, in its intention, the government wants to use the, fun, the funding that we have for good. Don't get me started on the whole, yeah. It doesn't always work that way thing, but that's the intention behind it. How about God? How does God want to use money? I would imagine for good. And we can't, uh, we can't provide a whole lot of good when we simply hold on to what I want to be mine. I might be able to do some good for me. But when has God ever called us to be so self-centered? Ultimately, money is to be used for good as this tool. Which is why Jesus proposes the answer that he does on the question of paying taxes. Because ultimately it's your choice. You can give it to Caesar. And it will be used for good to some extent, not exclusively. You can give it to God, and it should be used for good there, too. But here's the thing. In either case, it's your responsibility to get involved in the way that money is used. Giving it, a, giving it to Caesar, giving it to God, either way, get involved in the way that it's being used. Vote. Oh my goodness, midterms are coming up. Please go to the polls and vote, but don't go at the same time that I'm planning to go. Get involved in the life of the church. See how those funds that you so generously provide go to supporting the, the uh, faith journey of our children. See how we can make a difference in our community. And most importantly, when you see the funds that you are giving to Caesar, the government, or you see the funds you are giving to God or the church being used poorly, stand up against it. Because this tool is meant to be used for good. Because ultimately, this is the way that we all hold each other up, holding all things in common so that no one has a need. And when the lava starts to rise, we have this safety net of sorts. So my challenge for us this week is to use this tool 
our resources, our money for good, to use it for God. Let us pray. God of all provision, God of great generosity, God who has brought all things into existence, God to whom all things belong, we come before you during this time acknowledging, oh my goodness, how much I need my money to be mine. Because if it's not mine, how recklessly it could be spent. Because if it's not mine, how quickly I could become uncomfortable. Because if it's not mine, everything's going to go wrong, and I need this. But you have called us for a moment to see, to recognize that just because we may have it doesn't mean it's all for our purposes. You have called us to make a difference. A difference in the lives of so many across the globe who live in increasing poverty. For so many across the globe who do not have access to the privileges and advantages that we have. To make a difference out of love as you have called us to love. And so we lift up to you our brothers and sisters across the globe as well as those right next door to us and ask that you would embolden us in our faith. Grant us courage that we might step forth in your name with the resources you have provided us to make a difference for those who are hurting in ways we could scarcely imagine and those who are suffering in ways we know all too well. And so, holy God, As we present to you all our offerings, we lift them up to you and ask that you would do with them and us according to your good and perfect will. Up these prayers and those which are unspoken and on our hearts this morning as we pray now together that prayer which you taught us and your disciples to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. During this time, I want to invite you to stand as you are able or in spirit, and turn in your hymnals to number 438 as we sing together, Forth in thy name, O Lord.
Amen. Well, before we dismiss, two quick announcements, reminders. Guidance board meeting right after this, and this Saturday, trunk or treat, 4.30 p.m. in the Spring Hill Avenue parking lot. So with that being said, receive now this benediction. Wherever you may be or wherever you have to go, go to live and give generously. For by this tool, we make all the difference in the world. And may the God who has called you to honest, faithful, generous ministry give you peace. In the name of God, our creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Amen. Go in peace. Mm -hmm.